Historical gold maps provide insights into the geological features and gold mining operations of the past, helping prospectors to determine ideal locations to search for gold. If you're just starting out and are seeing some of the terms and features displayed on these maps for the first time, things can get a little confusing. Today we're going to take a look at some of these features, what they mean and what they look like, so you can have a better understanding of these old gold maps. You will find many of these features displayed on modern gold maps as well. If you're interested in checking out Goldfields maps, head over to my website historicalgoldmaps.com.au which provides an online directory of historical Goldfields maps, all free to view online. You'll also find some of my all-time favourites as huge high quality prints, which have been professionally restored, enhanced and styled as a set. I'll put a link in the description below, along with a discount code for you guys. So for this video, we're going to start with some of the most immediately confusing terms on historical gold maps, Silurian, or Division, and so on. Don't let this put you off. These terms are simply referring to the age of the ground in question using the geological timescale. I'll put a link in the description below in case you'd like to look into this a little more. So let's move on to another of the main features on historical gold maps, reefs. A reef is a vein of quartz in the ground, sometimes gold bearing. These can be marked on maps as reef, line of reef, quartz, quartz reef, and auriferous quartz reef. Auriferous means that the reef contains gold, but not all gold bearing reefs are marked on maps as being auriferous. Usually they're just marked as reefs and are typically shown by these straight lines. You will also see some reefs marked as outcrops, which means that the reef is exposed at the surface by erosion of the surrounding rock, rather than lying hidden underground. Some are also marked as quartz blows. These are huge masses of quartz which have been exposed at the surface. There is an incredible example of this at Lilica, at the Quartz Mountain Geological Reserve. Gold can either be mined directly from the reef, crushing the quartz and processing for gold, or from nearby areas where the gold has been eroded away from the reef over time. This latter form of mining is called alluvial mining. Gold which has broken away from its original location in a reef gets washed away over time by water and gravity and is eventually deposited into creeks and rivers. Many ancient gold bearing creeks and rivers have been covered over by geological changes such as lava flows. These ancient riverbeds buried beneath the ground are called leads. You will find leads marked on most gold maps and you will notice that they follow the same visual pattern as a modern day watercourse, with headwaters and tributaries leading into a river. Leads were often discovered and traced from shallow areas, usually around the headwaters of the ancient river, then followed deeper underground. Miners processed the ancient riverbed for gold, and the amount they got was often beyond belief. Shallow leads were worked relatively easily by gold miners, and you can see the remains of their diggings following the leads in many places throughout the goldfields. The leads beneath Ballarat were notoriously difficult to work, and miners had to sink their shaft through many layers of rock and dangerous drift often hundreds of feet deep. The leads which were deeply buried by lava flows, such as the Berry Lead near Creswick, required substantial capital and equipment to work for gold. These leads were worked by large mining companies. Exploratory boring to find the course of the lead was followed by the sinking of deep shafts, and massive pumping engines were required to keep the water at bay underground. Diggings, gold workings, and alluvial workings all refer to areas where alluvial mining has occurred. It is often marked on maps by dotted areas. This includes surfacing, creek workings, and sinking shallow shafts to reach buried leads. Men typically worked these alluvial areas alone or with a mate, or formed small companies with a few others. These were the diggings which brought people from all over the world, where any man could potentially strike it rich from their own labour, regardless of his previous position in life. Surfacing or paddocking is where miners stripped shallow gold-rich areas down to the bedrock by hand, and processed all the earth they removed using equipment such as gold puddlers and cradles. These areas are sometimes marked on old gold maps, and they are often easily spotted from above using Google Earth. These surfaced areas are of particular interest because they tell us there was gold here, and lots of it, and it wasn't very deep. Creeks were worked much the same as they are today, with the creek bed and banks being tested and processed for gold. Except miners back then used gold puddlers and cradles rather than the trommels and high bankers we use today. Shafts were sunk in alluvial areas where the gold-bearing layer of washed dirt was located deeper underground. 
These shafts were dug by hand, sometimes through dangerous drifts. Foul air in the shafts could often be as dangerous as water, so any shafts of somewhat substantial depth were ventilated using wind sails. You will often see shafts marked on old gold maps. These typically refer to large company mine shafts rather than the dense area of shafts in the alluvial diggings. These shafts will often have the names of the mining companies and sometimes a number one or number two as single companies could have multiple shafts. Some maps will also mark shafts as being a whip shaft or a whim shaft. Whips and whims are devices used for hauling rock, ore, miners and equipment up and down a shaft. These are more efficient than windlasses, but not as efficient as poppet heads. You may also come across adit or tunnel on these maps. An adit is a horizontal or nearly horizontal entrance to a mine, rather than a vertical shaft. Open cut mining is where minerals located above or close to the surface are extracted by excavation, leaving an open pit in the ground. These can be narrow cuttings in the ground which follow small reefs, or massive excavations which remove huge quantities of ore. You will sometimes come across spots marked as battery. These are stamp battery sites. A stamp battery is a machine which crushes gold bearing rock using a pounding action. They were widely used in Victoria during the late 19th and early 20th centuries before being replaced by more efficient crushing methods. They were typically housed in battery sheds like this one pictured at Tarradale. While there is rarely much left of any stamp batteries remaining in situ in the Victorian goldfields region, evidence of the battery is sometimes still present. Some sites retain part of the battery foundations, others still have the depressions in the ground where the foundations were set, and sometimes the loading ramp is present as well. Very rarely you may see gold puddlers or puddling machines marked on goldfields maps as well. Gold puddling is a technique for separating gold from clay, which was developed in the early years of the Victorian gold rush. In many areas, gold was trapped within tough clay, and in order to retrieve it, the clay needed to be effectively broken up. A circular trough in the ground, lined with wood, was filled with gold-bearing clay and water. The gold-bearing wash dirt was brought to the puddling machine from surrounding alluvial diggings. A horse circled the trough and dragged a harrow through the mixture, breaking up the lumps and turning it into a runny sludge. The gold and other heavy materials released from the clay would sink to the bottom. Once the larger rocks were manually removed, the heavy residue at the bottom of the puddler would then be cleaned up and washed for gold using a cradle or pan. Sometimes you will find races marked on maps. These are water channels which were used to transport water from one place to another, often to be used for mining. There are plenty of water races still flowing today, particularly around the Bendigo area. Another type of channel you may see marked on maps are sludge channels. Sludge is a waste product of alluvial mining such as hydraulic sluicing as well as cyaniding where tailings were released into waterways forming huge deposits of highly mobile sediment. This sludge blocked the streams causing problems such as flooding and burial of land. Sludge channels were constructed to divert mining sludge and minimize its impact on the surrounding areas. You'll also find anticlines and synclines marked on maps. These terms are referring to arch-like folds in the rock layers. A syncline is a fold where the youngest rocks occur in the core of the fold. In an anticline, it is the oldest rocks which occur in the core. Here is an amazing example of an anticlinal fold exposed in a road cutting in Castlemaine. A saddle reef is a mineral deposit associated with the crest of an anticlinal fold and following the bedding planes. Another feature you may come across are indicator lines. Ballarat miners discovered around the 1870s that where thin bands of dark slates crossed the quartz veins, the quartz was often unusually rich in gold. By following these slate lines, miners could locate the rich spots along the reefs with less work. These lines of slate became known as the indicator. Another interesting feature you may come across is Bay of Biscay Country. Named after the Bay of Biscay, which is notorious for its rough seas and violent storms, Bay of Biscay Country describes the dangerous and uneven ground which can be present in certain areas. Crab holes can be found on the surface which were often the cause of serious accidents. They can occur on the basaltic plains like this one near Carisbrook and are generally due to the unequal decomposition of the underlying rock. You will soon notice while looking at these gold maps that there are some commonly recurring names which were used throughout the gold fields. There are plenty of Scheisser gullies, hard hills, red hills, pennyweight flats, nuggety gullies and so on. 
Shiser is a term to describe an unproductive gold mine. Shiser gullies probably yielded very little gold, or perhaps the miners who found it just named it so to keep others away. Pennyweight was used to describe areas which only yielded about a pennyweight of gold. Many places were named after dead animals. In Bendigo alone, you'll find a dead dog gully, a dead cat gully, and dead horse gully. Over at Forest Creek, they even have a dead man's gully. There is a very old burial ground situated there. As you can see, historical gold maps provide a wealth of information for both gold prospectors and anyone with an interest in Victoria's rich and fascinating gold mining history. Head over to historicalgoldmaps.com.au to browse through a big directory of Goldfields maps, all free to view online. I've also got a few of my absolute favourites available as huge high quality prints. I'll put a link in the description below, as well as a discount code. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, let me know by hitting the like button. Don't forget to subscribe to Goldfields Guide on YouTube.